This morning, Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is one of those classic archetypal stories we have, especially in the early pages of the book of Genesis. The first 11 chapters of Genesis filled with these archetypal stories about humanity, about why things are the way they are. Genesis means origin, so these are stories of origins and beginnings and why relationships with humans are the way they are, why the divine human relationship is the way that it is if you begin in chapter one you begin reading the creation story I didn't really realize maybe I wasn't paying attention but it wasn't until I was in college that I realized in chapter two halfway through verse four there's a second creation story the first one more about order and how God's bringing form out of chaos and putting all things in order all things necessary for life but then in chapter 2, begins again telling the story of creation, but this time a more intimate, intimate portrait, a more interpersonal story about first man and first woman and how they relate to God. And by the time we get to chapter 3, we're talking about why are we estranged from God? Why separation? Why so much trouble in our lives? Our best Bible scholars do not take these stories as historical, but archetypal. That is, they're about the human condition. They're describing things that are true about all humanity, every one of us. This is a coming-of-age story for humanity. They've been in paradise in a state of innocence and now they move to a state of knowing or knowledge. They know the difference between good and evil from henceforth. We're all born naked, unaware, unselfconscious. But we move to a place of awareness of self and sexuality, a consciousness about who we are and who others are and how relationships work. This is a story about freedom and responsibility and how well we handle those opportunities it's a story about trust and distrust in our relationships especially our relationship with God or to ground it in more theological terms it is a story of free will and sin at the beginning of chapter 3 the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, which I read from, it says this serpent is crafty. In other translations, the serpent's called sneaky or cunning. But all of them give us the idea that this serpent's been around the block a time or two, knows a little bit more than first man and first woman, and is going to lead them down a path that God perhaps did not intend. That is, they're tempted and as soon as the serpent tells them that there's more to know, they want to know. They want to be in the know. You may have had that experience where you heard a little something about somebody else. You didn't have the whole story, but you wanted to know. 
It's fueled gossip, gossip from the beginning of time. Inquiring minds want to know, right? We have had that experience ourselves. These are stories telling us about the human condition and human nature. These are stories telling us about ourselves. That humans have the opportunity to know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. But what the crafty, sneaky, cunning one doesn't tell them during the temptation is that when you know the difference, you also become well acquainted with guilt and shame. You know the difference between right and wrong. And we have all had the experience where we know the difference. We've been told no and we go anyway. Kathy prayed about it in the prayer that sometimes we choose the wrong path. And when we're confronted with our own decisions, the story says we hide, that we all hide. Verse 8 and 9, where we began to read, tell us they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Again, this is archetypal. God is calling to each of us, asking us, Where are you? What are you doing with your life? How are you behaving? Where are you? And the story says that the man, the first man, was naked And afraid, verse 10, the man responds, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He begins to be inquired of from God. God says in verse 11, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And that's when humans begin to try to talk themselves out of what they've acted their way into. Maybe you've had that experience too, where you've done something or not done something, but you try to explain it away when confronted. You try to talk your way out of what you have already done. That's what begins to happen here, where the man begins to try to explain what has happened. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. The man takes no responsibility, begins to kind of blame God. Well, you gave her to me and then she offered and, well, I ate, but it's not really my fault. I mean, that's the intent. Can't really blame me. You can't really hold me responsible for my behavior. Maybe you've had that experience trying to talk your way out of or blame somebody else. So one human tendency when confronted or when we feel guilty is to blame others. Then God moves on and inquires of the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman blames also. She says, the serpent tricked me and I ate. Again, not really my fault. But there's another biblical insight here is that we can be tricked, we can be deceived, and led astray. Others will do that to us. And there's a third insight that I want us to notice, is that when we have been deceived, it leads to enmity, is the word used in the NRSV. It leads to discord or hostility. It leads to conflict. It can lead to hate. It can lead to violence. In this story, it talks about the enmity between the snake or the serpent and humans and why we kind of have this natural reaction against being close to snakes. But it's not too far a step to also see how this is giving us some insight into how humans interact. And when we trick or deceive or lead someone else astray, 
It leads to problems. It leads to enmity or hostility or discord or conflict. It can lead to hate. It can lead to broken relationships. We can harm one another. The story gives us opportunity to reflect about all of that and how human relationships work. It's a book I read in the last year entitled The Spirituality of Imperfection. It talks a lot about human relationships and why they break. And at one point, they want to go back to the origins and they write this about humans. It says, Our pain and sorrow begin at the very beginning when we begin within our family. Family contains its own paradox, serving on the one hand as shield and protection against newborn vulnerability, and on the other hand, as the setting within which we suffer our first wounds. As infants, we are dependent upon our parents to defend and shelter us, and yet it is inevitably also our parents who first wound us. Given our prolonged physical immaturity and the complex dangers of our modern world, those who love us must forbid no as often as they affirm yes. I think you've had that experience where someone said no, and maybe you obeyed at first, but then at some point in your life you decided, I'm going to try anyway. I'm going to go down that path and see what's there, see what it's like, and you follow one of those tempting paths and experience what it's like down that road. Another way to understand what this passage is trying to explain is to understand that we have become, even though part of the animal kingdom, ethical animals, When the tiger kills the antelope, we do not call it murder because we do not believe the tiger has the capacity to reflect or understand good and evil, right and wrong. But we cross a threshold when we come to humanity where we begin to understand right and wrong. Dr. Leslie D. Weatherhead, the great Methodist preacher from the last century, writes about this. I want to read you a few sentences he wrote. He says, in primitive society, rules emerge. If a man steals his neighbor's cow, he's punished by the tribe. The word stealing now has meaning, and stealing does not pay. If he steals his neighbor's wife, the whole tribe rises against him and imposes a penalty because tribal life cannot be made to work without rules. The word adultery then has a meaning, and the tribe says adultery does not pay. So some things a man does are right, but others are wrong conscience at first the lowly child of fear of consequence either from the gods or other men is born and with it the first feelings of guilty fear the story talks about coming of age of moving from not knowing to knowing from not having the knowledge of right and wrong, but also not carrying the guilt or shame from knowing and violating. The story says we all have acquired, humanity has acquired an inner knower that we know the difference between good and evil, that we are ethical beings, if you will, created in the image of God. And now we have to navigate freedom and responsibility. We have to weigh the differences between good and evil when we decide about behaviors and actions. We have to deal with our free will and our tendency toward sin. It can be a hard story to read. It can be difficult to hear. It can be difficult 
sometimes devastating to look at ourselves and learn who we really are. But let us not miss the good news in this passage about God. And notice that God is seeking us, is seeking a relationship with humanity, even when first man and first woman have violated the relationship and violated God's trust. God doesn't abandon them. God is still seeking a relationship with them. God is still coming after them, calling out to them, where are you seeking this relationship? This dialogue, this conversation, this intimacy, this knowing of one another, even when we have fallen short, even when we feel unworthy, even when we are hiding God is seeking us one of the commentators i read this week wrote about this and said if we learn to see first ourselves as limited then everything shifts the whole world turns upside down for how can i fixate on the thought that there's something wrong with someone else if i'm looking at the world from the framework that there's definitely something wrong with me Looked at in this way, the other person isn't weird or pathetic, but a brother or sister in weakness and imperfection. Looked at from this perspective, another person's strengths become reason for my hope. If they could climb above this imperfection, if they could find a way to be strong, then there's hope for me too. In such a vision and in such a place, we can stop trying to conceal our imperfection and therefore our very essence. We can stop hiding. For what is there to hide or hide from when it is our very weaknesses that give us strength and community the theological point here is that God wants to interact with us God wants to have this relationship with us even when we are not perfect even when we are weak even when we have violated others or violated our relationship with God even when we're naked and afraid and hiding the story says God is seeking us we maybe can see it most clearly in the story beyond where we read after the story describes pain and trouble and toil we're going to know as humans in verse 21 it says and the lord god made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them they are naked and afraid and hiding and god comes in and provides for them god provides clothing wraps them in care gives them some security if you will god stays with them even in their moment of weakness but certainly in their moment of need god provides they're going to have to leave the garden of innocence they're going to have to make their way in the world but god does not abandon them god goes with them and god provides for them a biblical theme we should cling to forever no matter what we have done or left undone no matter what we've done right or done wrong god wants to be in relationship with us god wants to be in relationship with you God knows you need help, and God is ready to provide it. God calls, where are you? How will you answer? Amen. Thanks be to God.